we're continuing our series through Mark and we have reached the end of Mark chapter 6. Um, so uh, Chris is going to read for us. So if you have your Bible, please open it up or turn it on. Mark chapter 6, we're starting at verse 45 to verse 56. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried those who were ill on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside, they placed those who were ill in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Thanks, Chris. Um, honest, honestly, I really struggled with this this week. I hugely struggled with this passage this week, because again, it's a passage that we know really well, but we don't necessarily know Mark's telling of it, do we? Usually when we look at the uh, events of Jesus walking on the water, we go straight to Matthew's version of the event. And we focus not so much on Jesus, but on Peter. Because Matthew is the one who tells us about Peter walking out to meet Jesus and being rescued from drowning and being overwhelmed by the storm. But Mark doesn't mention Peter. And we're in Mark's Gospel. So for me... This meant that as I came to look again and to prepare what I was going to say to you today about this passage, actually I had to put aside everything that I thought I knew, kind of wipe the slate clean and start again. I've developed, or at least I'm trying to develop, a new habit in my approach to reading my Bible. And I want to encourage you to try this. Because um, I know how many of you have those Bible study notes that drive me absolutely mad because they're one line of scripture lifted totally out of context and then someone writes a page and a half of waffle about it and you don't get to see where in the grand story of the Bible in the whole meta-narrative of scripture that that verse comes from and the danger is you can end up with a bit of a jigsaw puzzle kind of faith <coughs> loads of great pieces but with no idea how they all fit together so I suggest to you a discipline that you might want to try Put your Bible study notes aside for a while and choose a book of the Bible. Any book, but probably a New Testament book if the, for the first time that you try it. Settle yourself down somewhere quiet, away from any distractions, and have a notebook with you. So that if something urgent or important pops into your head like, oh, I must buy milk from the shops, you can write it down in your notebook. And then you can let it go from your head and not worry about it because it will be there when you've finished. If I don't write that down, I either can't let it go out of my head, it's all I can focus on, or we never get milk. <laughs> and then take your passage. It might just be one passage under a heading as this is, or if it's small enough, a chapter. So you want enough that there's content, but not so much that you've got to rush through it or that there's too much that you can't take it in. And then pray and ask God to focus your mind and ask him to speak through his word. Read it through once slowly and then just pause. Is there anything that you noticed? A word, a theme, a picture, the spark of something just started off, the thread of something just there. Just let it rest 
Don't try and chase it down just yet. Kind of pause and leave room for God. Just a minute or two. It doesn't have to be painful. Um, and then when you're ready, read the passage again, the same passage. And this time ask God to show you what he wants you to notice, to develop that idea or theme a bit more. Are there things in there that you never noticed before? Is there something you want to know more about? Write the questions down. And then maybe think, you know, if you were going to take one verse or one theme or one image and you were going to write it or draw it, what would that be? And then start to maybe write some of those ideas down in your notebook. Find the verse in the whole passage that inspires you or the questions that challenge you or the theme that interests you and reflect on that. So, for instance, in reading this passage, one of the questions I came up with, and this is how daft they can be, uh, one of the questions I came up with was, Jesus told them to go to Bethsaida, but they landed at Gennesaret. Okay, so they got blown off course by the storm, probably, but if you look at a map of the, the Sea of Galilee, uh, Bethsaida, you know, if you treated it as a clock, Bethsaida's between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock, and Gennesaret's at 9 o'clock. That's a long way to be blown off course. So then I thought, well, okay, so I, I can appreciate they might have got blown off. So where did they set off from? Well, if we read John's version of events, they set off from Bethsaida and they were aiming for Capernaum, which is sort of between 9 and 10. It's really close to Gennesaret and would make more sense for them to have been blown a little bit off course rather than completely on a different shore of the sea. I found that absolutely fascinating. I was down that rabbit hole for hours, church, I tell you. But that was one of the questions that occurred to me as I read through the passage. So I wrote it down and I've been reading and researching and, re and re researching around it, looking online and through my commentaries. It's fascinating. So find the theme or verse that challenges you, that inspires you, that speaks to you and write it down. <coughs> Spend time just a few minutes thinking about it with God and then when you're ready read the passage through again before you finish the whole point of doing it this way is that you don't rush you take time over scripture you take time with God to listen to think to reflect you always take something away with you that you've heard from God I mean depending on how big the passage is that I choose generally from start to finish this process takes me about an hour, so it is a bit longer, it is asking a bit more of you than your 15 minute quiet time, but I can assure you it is worth it. And I have to say God never lets me down, every single time I do this God meets me in his word in incredible ways. I see things that I've never seen before. And don't forget, if you come up with some questions, you've got me as a resource. You know, if you've got a question that you can't find an answer to, then message me. I had one message last week that absolutely floored me, sent me off down another rabbit hole. Uh, someone asked, you know, when Jesus had fed for 5,000 people and they gathered up 12 baskets of leftovers, do you remember that? We looked at that last week. Where did the baskets come from? <laughs> <laughs> Mentioning no names, Janet Neen. <laughs> um, I have no idea. I have asked people who have PhDs who have no idea. But I was so encouraged that someone was reading their Bible and noticing these details and being interested by them. It really blessed my heart. So then read, and then when you come to read again, read the next passage on, or the next chapter on, so you get to read a whole book and see how it fits together then you don't end up with lots of little bits and pieces. You might have to come in if you're on the edge and getting a bit wet, bless you. So you don't end up with little bits and pieces that can become little more than pithy sayings. So that's what I decided to do with this passage. Put everything I thought I knew to one side. Come with a clean page in my notebook and just read the passage through a few times as Mark told it. Looking particularly at what's going on, what is the point that Mark is making? What is he wanting me to see? And I can tell you it was fascinating when I did this. I had the best time. So actually today you'll have to forgive me. It's a kind of a gathering up of my thoughts and the things that struck me as I was reflecting on this passage today. And I hope that's okay with you. So today's passage follows on from one of the busiest, most exhausting days that the disciples have ever, ever had. 
They were returning from their missionary journeys. They'd met with Jesus to tell him everything that they'd done and experienced. They'd heard the devastating news that John the Baptist had been killed. And so they'd gone, if you remember, they'd gone with Jesus to try and find a solitary place to rest, to recoup, to recharge their batteries. But they hadn't been able to rest, had they? The crowds had followed them and Jesus had had compassion on all the people. And so instead of spending that precious time with his disciples, instead he gathered the people and he taught them. And then they had seen and been part of that incredible miracle of feeding all of those huge crowds of people. And so you can only imagine the level of exhaustion they must have been feeling by this point. And Jesus has sent them off on their own to go ahead of him to the other side of the lake, wherever that destination might be. <laughs> while Jesus has gone somewhere quiet to pray. So Jesus sent the disciples ahead of him and the disciples end up caught in another storm. The wind and the waves are against them and they, already exhausted, find themselves wrestling with the boat all night, trying to get to the shore. We're not told that their lives are in danger this time, but we're told that they're wrestling, that they're fighting, that they're struggling with the oars. They're being blown off course and they've been rowing all night. I mean, I've had three children at one point, I had three under five and so I do recognise the level of exhaustion talked about in this passage that the disciples must have been feeling by now. They must have been totally at the end of themselves. But look at verse 48. Look at verse 48 from wherever Jesus was, it says he saw the disciples straining at the oars. Now, look, I've been in a storm, you've been in storms, we've all been in storms, you know, where the wind's blowing, the rain's falling, and you know you can't see your hand in front of your face, can you? You know, uh, the sort where if you're driving you need your windscreen wipers on apocalypse level. Um, but Jesus, it said, could see them. Jesus could see them, whether physically or supernaturally, his eye was on them. And he could get to them. So even if they felt like they were in the storm alone, they really, really weren't. And it says, just before dawn, Jesus walked out to them across the lake, walking on the water. Kathy and I uh, went for a walk this week around the lake at Clumber Park. It's a lovely walk. But you know when you look out over the lake, and you see that uh, Greek temple thing opposite you with the columns. And uh, you think, oh, shall we just walk to that? And then we'll walk back. And uh, by the time you get there, you realise you're halfway round. And it's as far to go back as it is to carry on. We debated at that point, attempting to walk across water. I mean, the <laughs> cup of tea was there. We could smell the cake. It was right in front of us. But no, we had to walk another two miles first. <laughs> But Jesus comes to them striding across the lake. And we get that strange phrase. Did you notice that phrase? He was about to pass by them. Mm. What? The disciples were struggling and had been rowing all night and Jesus just meant to walk on by and, and leave them to it. No. The Greek word that is used here is the same word that's been translated from the Hebrew in those incredible moments when God passed by his people when he showed them his glory and there are two significant passages in the old testament that i want to draw your attention to the first one is in exodus chapter 33 starting at verse 19 and it goes to 34 verse 7 where moses asks god to show him his glory and god responds by passing by him and proclaiming his identity let me read to you from exodus 33 it says this and the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And the second one is uh, 
In 1 Kings 19, verse 11 to 12, the Lord tells Elijah to stand on the mountain, for the Lord is about to pass you by. Let me read that passage to us. It says, uh, a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. I love that. It just brings to mind that old hymn, doesn't it? The one that says, you know, speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of calm. What's that one? Dear Lord and Father of my... I'll not sing this one. <laughs> Dear Lord and Father of mankind. And so when we read that Jesus intended to pass by his disciples, he's not talking about leaving them struggling and carrying on without him. It's talking about showing them his awesome glory. But in their tired, exhausted, stressed, hard-hearted state, they just couldn't recognise Jesus. They thought they were seeing a ghost or something, and so they were terrified. They didn't see Jesus in his glory because they couldn't see it. The one they'd travelled with, the one they'd eaten with, talked with, learned from, the one who had sent them out in the power of the Holy Spirit to cast out demons and heal people, they couldn't recognise him. More than that, it says that their hearts were hardened and they hadn't understood about the loaves. That gave me pause. I mean, they've just... These disciples, they've just seen and been involved in and included in an incredible miracle of God. But they just hadn't understood the significance of what they had done and what they'd seen. Yes, it was a miracle. Yes, it was incredible. But the dots hadn't quite joined in their head yet. That this is God at work feeding his people, just as Moses fed the people with the bread from heaven in the wilderness. They saw it, they were a part of it, but they hadn't had time yet to reflect, to ponder and to understand. It's like those, you know, those charity machine things, you know, those things you used to get. I always used to be raising money for the RNLI when I was a kid. They were always in the chip shop. Um, you always used to put your penny in or your 2p in and it went round and round and round and round and round and round and eventually it would drop into the pot at the bottom. Well, these poor disciples in the boat... Their penny is still rattling round and round and round. It hasn't dropped in yet. Jesus doesn't chide them and tell them off for having little faith or anything like that. Instead, he speaks words of comfort and courage. He reassures them that it is him, that they are not alone. And then he climbs in the boat with them. And when they land... We get the contrast, don't we? The disciples' blindness and inability to recognise Jesus contrasted with the people on the shore who the minute they see Jesus recognise him and start bringing all of their sick and infirm to him to be healed. And that really stands there, Mark's really put that in as a contrast. The disciples couldn't see, but the people on the shore could I feel so sorry for the disciples in this passage, actually. Many of us have had times in our lives where we have been so unbelievably tired and yet there is no opportunity for rest. The storms that surround us seem relentless and we've no option but to keep pressing on. And so there are a couple of things I just want to say to us this morning from our passage. Number one, whatever storm you're battling, However exhausted you are, Jesus sees, Jesus knows, Jesus is with you. You might feel at times like you're completely alone, battling through the storm on your own, running out of strength. Jesus sees, he knows, he's with you. Today I offer you his words, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. The second thing I want us to notice, the disciples were in the storm because they obeyed Jesus. They were battling through the storm because they had heard his voice and done what he asked. Please don't think that following Jesus 
is going to be all sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes we will be called to journey and battle through storms. Just because you're in a storm doesn't mean that you've done things wrong. Sometimes Jesus leads us through those storms. See, no one ever said that following Jesus would be easy, did they? Taking up your cross daily kind of implies the absolute opposite, really. Don't think that if you hear his voice and do what he says, that you will avoid the storms. Actually, you could find yourself led directly into one. But remember, God sees. He knows. He is with you, so take courage and don't be afraid. Keep rowing. Keep pushing forward. Keep battling. Keep going. Keep making your way through the storm. You will get there. You will reach the shore. And this brought to mind to me one of my absolute favourite verses in the whole Bible. And it reminds us of the truth of God's presence with us, no matter what we go through. It says this. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Church, I don't know what each of you are going through right now. I know some of what some of you are going through. But Jesus knows. He sees. He is with you. So take courage and don't be afraid. Shall we pray?